welcome to the Foolish Kitchen. And this foolish thing I've done this week is I finally got my hands on a Sterno chafing dish. A Sterno and Company from New York. Um, they were the monsters of the chafing dish alcohol stove um, ca tabletop tea kettle universe. That was what they did. Most of their stuff was not copper. This was actually one of their minor lines. Um, this one is, is packaged and dated 18, uh, 18.99, and I got it for a literal steal because apparently nobody wants them anymore except for when they're big and elaborate. Because um, I was very excited because it has most of the pieces. When I was growing up, chafing dishes were like a, a, an entertaining thing, a fondue set that was really big when I was a kid. Um, I never even looked at a chafing dish cookbook until recently because it was like. Oh, I never realized that bef between the Civil War and World War One, they were essentially the microwave. Um, so this is most of the pieces. This is the stand. This is the important part, which I, you almost never see. This is the water bath um, for diffusing the heat uh, for um, anything that's dairy related, milk, eggs, uh, cheese, milk, eggs. You need lower temperatures so that otherwise you have a burner here. Um, an alcohol stove burner uh, kind of looks like a Bunsen burner and you'll see them mismarked all the time as oil lamps but they were for alcohol and um, that fit here which I do have one coming of the same vintage this set had this and it has this which you almost never see and then this is called a blazer um, it can be used without the water bath if you're doing um, meat something that has to like it's basically like a stir fry. I was so excited. I just washed it again. I was so excited. The bottom, this one is, is rounded and I've seen them more of a square bottom, especially the post World War II ones were entertaining. Different shape entirely. Um, so this is the blazer. This is the water bath. And then it has a lid. And the handles are wood and the paint is worn off so it's this wonderful finish. And it's uh, copper and brass which I think is one of the reasons you do normally just see copper and brass, which is not even a popular, the popular ones were the nickel plated. And I think a lot of that stuff got melted down in World War II. A lot of, I mean, you might see silver plated ones, very ornamental, and they're a lot, priced a lot higher because more of a decorative piece. Whereas I was looking for something utilitarian and I wasn't, I'm not even, I'm kind of disappointed it's been polished. But in my hands, it won't be stay polished. Uh, it's got some dings, it's got some dents. It's absolutely, in my eyes, gorgeous. So, sorry, we had a little interlude. The dog was thinking that my banging was a knock on the door. My dog doorbell went off. Um, so, like I said, it has most of the pieces, and in my eyes, it's beautiful. So, uh, <laughs> I know, I told you, this is the Foolish Kitchen, and that's not a random title. So. I'm going to try using it with my alcohol stove. Um, it will actually fit this um, this other sterno uh, chafing hand heat will actually fit in there beautifully. And I'm thinking maybe I should try that one first. But I just thought my first attempt I should use something that I understand, which will be this. Um, and. Most of them, I read a whole bunch of Jaffa Dish cookbooks recently, but they aren't really like the instructions that you would, that would come with it. So basically my first question was, how much water do you put in here? And I don't know. I'm guessing because this line doesn't actually resemble it. That's the rim for the stand. So I measured out it two, if two cups in here will allow the blazer to sit comfortably any more than it will float too much. It will sit comfortably, floats just a hair. So I'm thinking that that's probably the number, this is two cup. Anything less probably will boil away. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I mean it's, I'm making, I'm going to be making eggs so it's, they're not going to, it's not going to take very long. And this, the, the, that's bothering me but 
It seems to be stable, pretty work, works pretty well. So we're doing two cups of water. And uh, I'm doing a recipe from Fanny Merritt Farmer's Chaving Dish Possibilities. Um, she is the author of the Boston Cooking School cookbook. And in my research, I found out she made a chaving dish cookbook, so I got my hands on one. It is not, I mean, it is, it's an all-inclusive. Essentially, what I'm finding is a pattern with the chafing dish recipes. A lot of creams, a lot of sauces, things that be, I mean, obviously it was designed, you know, in this era, people who used it lived in uh, rooming houses. They used, lived in places there was no, no electric, no gas. Americans didn't have, um, uh, like the English bed setters had. A, a gas ring we never had that feature um, as far as I know so basically this was people using it were obviously hotels a table side entertaining uh, a lot of the women um, who had I mean they may have had a maid they may have had a cook but they were experimenting with showing off their cooking capabilities so it, it's as inclusive as a chasing dish uh, recipe book can be um, a lot of the meats uh, are uh, seafoods or very thin um, uh, cuts of meat that cook quickly. So basically, uh, there's a there's a theme for this kind of cooking. But what I'm finding is almost all of these recipes can be made in the modern day. There's um, on a low uh, flame on a on any kind of burner, and uh, except for ones that have elaborate lots of pieces, they can also be made outdoor cooking on any kind of a burner. So what I'm going to do is a recipe called um, Venetian eggs, which is essentially scrambled eggs over toast with extra stuff in it. Um, a lot of these egg recipes, a lot of the recipes have been given fancy titles that they do not deserve because they're being made by the woman of the house. She just doesn't want to make scrambled eggs. She wants to make scrambled eggs a la Swiss or a la something. But this recipe had a little uh, notation called try next to it. And a lot of the dish recipes in this book have little uh, marks next to them. So I was, it was like a bonus. Um, I got to see, you know, what else somebody else was thinking. But they put try next to it. So we're going to try it. Um, being an old-fashioned recipe is written in a paragraph, so uh, bear with me. Okay, two tables. We're going to, first let's, let's get the... The first thing is almost always is two tablespoons of butter, so that seems to be the, unless you're making a sauce, in which case it's a lot more butter and a lot more flour, but let's get the fire going with this, because the first thing in it is going to be our, um, our eggies. The, the deluxe set has an underplate, has a tray. That's why I'm not doing this on um, a tablecloth, which not like I ever do. But it usually had an underplate, and then there was a chop plate. Uh, it had other pieces, but this is... So I'm going to... This doesn't fit in here, so we're going to put it in there. And I'm going to light it up. not quite right for this stand so it should work just fine I don't know how long it's going to take and I'm wondering if I do need a water bath I'm going to try it without the water bath because I think that's going to take a while to boil yeah. maybe that's better I'm just going to do it on the blazer, because it's basically scrambled eggs, it doesn't, I mean, if it was, you know, and, yeah, that works, all right, let's get in our, this is, I melted this last night for something else, so, two tablespoons of butter, Squared. I it was melted last night. Okay, a bit of bay leaf. Let's 
small one. Anyways, and as for a blade of mace, which I do not have, but I do have mace is, from what I understand, mace is a coating of a nutmeg, so it's a m different, milder flavor. So I'm going to put nutmeg in, and we're not going to tell anybody. yellow. I don't know what that means. But I can go in there. And the next thing I'm going to put in is maybe the mace of parts of color. Maybe that's part of it. It says until it turns yellow. And it says to remove the bay leaf. But we're going to leave them for a little while and I'll take it out later. You can't eat them. They're sharp and don't get soft. Um, so we're going to add one and a half cups of tomato. I don't know if it's one and a half cups, it's tomato. I had a tomato. And I'm going to put our tomato in. Also in my research, which you'll find in another post on, post, uh, on Foolish Kitchen, I found that Fanny used to, um, she loved chafing dishes, and she used to do lots of demonstrations and exhibits and it got her out of the out of the cooking school when she could go places and demonstrate stuff. So I found that in a few mentions, um, and I thought that was that must have made her very very happy to be able to get out and about. Mm, it's butter and tomato, huh? No, I'm already there. This is great. And as for one fourth cup of cheese, cut in small pieces. Yeah, if I'd use the water bath, we'd still be waiting for that thing to warm up. I'm going to try the water bath on something else. I've got a couple of seafood things I want to try. Um, another... It works without that thing. Um, another group of people who really grabbed onto the chafing dish were college students. Started in the girls' dorms, but also men living alone in their own rooms. Um, loved chafing dishes. There was a whole bunch of bachelor things. It was, it, like I said, it was a fad. It got really, really popular. Um, late 1800s, women were not supposed to cook in their dorms. It was punishable. You could get expelled. It was horrible. Of course they did. They did it late at night. They'd sneak in windows to each other's rooms. It was, you can research it. It, it kind of... Uh, got more popular, you know, traveled on the grapevine, all of a sudden they're trading recipes, uh, the most famous of which is the Vassar Fudge, which I will be making. I couldn't wait to do this. I want to make Vassar Fudge, which is just fudge. It's just, um, it's just over a chafing dish. So they would have these, they invented a couple of words. Um, the woman from Vassar who invented the word fudge. Fudge was already an expletive, you know, how, probably in lieu of the other F word, my favorite F word. Um, so they would call it, she called it, got called fudge. I, <laughs> before that, the, as far as I know, my research tell, shows me that the word fudge didn't refer to uh, chocolate candy or fudgy candy. Anyways, um, that works. And the other thing that they coined was the word spread because every girl would bring different foods, comestibles. You know, olives were really popular, pickles were really popular. You know, cheeses, anything that doesn't have to be, you know, preserved things, um, stuff that could be, you know, put out on a bedspread, put out on a spread, everybody got, you know, brought in something, and then the fudge was like one of the centerpieces, and a lot of these recipes, almost, almost all of them are sort of over toast. Well, a lot of them are, you know, cheesy and gooey and saucy and yummy, and a lot of them are served over toast. I did make some toast. It's not very toasty. Okay, I just wanted to get to heat everything through before. Right, let's get the bay leaf out because I'm supposed to. I also think people reused bay leaves. There's no reason not to. And we're gonna put in some cheese. I don't think this is as much cheese as recipe called for, but I, I had for cheddar, and it's a chopped small, I didn't shred it, 
one fourth cup cheese cut in small pieces. Doesn't say what kind of cheese, but I'm assuming it was an interesting cheese. All right, that melted pretty quick. And we want three eggs slightly beaten. These are three eggs slightly beaten. Well, I think I beat them a lot, so. Melt it up. There we go. I might switch from the wooden thing to this thing because it's going to be easier to clean. This is one teaspoon of salt, which I think is a lot of salt. I'm going to do a pinch. Cheese, my cheese is pretty salty. I don't need that much salt. Now, another thing I noticed in Fanny's recipes, yeah, you got to keep scraping the bottom. It's one of the reasons I, I was uncertain about the water bath um, and starting to cook is that she calls, most of the time, she does not call for pepper. She calls for a lot of paprika. And I'm not sure if that's a personal affectation or a fad. You know, maybe it just adds, maybe paprika was the spice of the day. Uh, it's not a fork, it's a little bit. But we will put paprika in. And I like pepper. Uh, but I'm very surprised. The, um, this is very, very stable. Uh, a lot more stable than a lot of um, a lot more stable than a lot of uh, camping outfits. You know, when you get your your camp stove and it has such a sort of a you, know, you put this huge pot on top of a tiny little stand. There we go. There we go. Cook until eggs are of a creamy consistency, stirring constantly and scraping from the bottom of the pan. Pour over slices of toasted bread. So this is not, it's heating the bottom kind of evenly, and it's not scorching unless I kind of walked away and forgot about it. So, I mean, the eggs look curdled, but they're not curdled as much as I've just kind of broken up into small curds, as opposed to nice, gentle scrambled eggs. Maybe I should have. It's just stir constantly, scraping the bottom. And I was, I mean, the cheese would absolutely scorch if I left it. There. Most of the recipes I'm seeing, if they're entrees or breakfasts, it's not um, not uh, appetizers, uh, entertaining foods. One, most of the ones I'm seeing are plenty for a couple, plenty for two people, one person with leftovers. I I was debating about cutting this in half. Okay, we are. Where's my bollocks? Uh, I need my. Uh, my thing. That can happen. Um, the one that gets sold with sits in the thing, so that won't happen to that. But I just want to turn that off without... Did you see what I did with the ring? Okay, if I edited it, it was because I couldn't find my who's imager to turn that off. And it was
was just where it was supposed to be. I'm going to probably do this again. stuff like this before scrambled eggs with cheese and tomatoes and my experience was the tomatoes were very liquidy and they tend to you got to get rid of some of that moisture otherwise it makes the um, kind of divide up but there we go and now we're down to the cleaning part and that is also not covered in any of the books so thanks for watching this is the foolish kitchen